it's a pleasure for me to present uh, Tommaso Peggio um, for the, in, in this conference uh, for his paper uh, he, he had announced, Nam Pune Servus Est Non Cesaris. Uh, well, um, Tommaso Beggio is an international um, Romanist, Romanist in the sense of legal historian who works on Roman law. Um, and he is working for the moment as um, assistant professor, associate professor in Trento. Um, but he has um, an interesting uh, um, um, curriculum vitae behind him. He started to study in Trento and uh, in Pavia, and then he uh, well spent almost 10 years abroad, um, especially in Germany, at German universities, in Heidelberg, in Cologne, Munich, and at the Max Planck Institute in, in Hamburg. And um, uh, three years of almost four years, he spent at the University of Helsinki, working there in, in the course of the ERC, European Project, reinventing the foundations of European legal culture, which was uh, um, initi initiated by Caius Tuori, and which is still lasting on as far as I know. I know. Well, no. um, this, this stay in Helsinki, I suppose, um, paved the way for his first book, on uh, which is um, a history of science, more or less, of um, um, Romanism in the 20th century. It's about um, uh, Koshaka. And um, I don't know if the name of Koshaka is, is uh, familiar to those who did not work on Roman law. I suppose not. But Paul Koshaka is one of the great, famous um, legal historians of the 20th century. And he vocated for, um, well, reinvention of European legal science uh, by the use of the Roman experience, of the antique Roman experience. This um, is an, in, an interesting um, point, which is, has been repeated in the, in the later, in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the newer past, for example, by Renat Zimmermann, but in a different way, a different methodolo methodological way. But um, this is an example of reinvest, reinventing European culture Real European legal culture in the in the 20th century. Well, in the second book, I have it here on my table. Oh, I had it here on my table. Um, is about is about uh, the Servitus Pöne in Roman law. Uh, Tommaso Beccio uh, is not only a, um, um, a, a, a historian of of uh, legal science, but he is a Romanist by himself. That means he's working with Roman law texts. And he occupied in the in his last years on the Servitus Pöne and wrote an interesting book. And in this book, uh, Tommaso Beccio um, has the um, well the challenge to um, um, uh, to investigate in the construction of the Servitus Pöne in antiquity and um, to parallel this with the the, the 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 question if Servitus Pöne is a form of Servitus Fisci. And this is, I think, uh, the, the, the topic he is going to tell about today. And you've got a, an interesting handout with a lot of uh, legal texts. Um, and I hope you have it in front of you, because as far as I, I know from um, legal historians, uh, Tommaso Beccio will uh, point to that text several times. Thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Beccio. Um, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I would like first to thank Professor Martin Schermeyer for the kind invitation to give a lecture at the Joseph Miller Lectures today. It is an honor to me to be here. And many thanks, of course, to Mr. Herbert for the organization of this meeting. And many thanks to one and all to be here to attend my presentation, even if it's uh, via Zoom and not in presence. But thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. So the topic I will deal with today is the so-called servitus pene, the slavery of punishment or penal slavery, also known as Strafsklaverei in German or servitù della pena in Italian. It has to be underlined that the servitus pene was not one of the typical kind of slavery known in ancient Rome since the archaic period and then since the Republican time. Nor was it known in other communities and populations of the Mediterranean area 
at that time. We can infer from the digest and the institutions of the Emperor Justinian that there were many modes of enslavement in ancient Rome. They could be either um, Jure Civili or Jure Gentium, the former being as peculiar to Rome, the latter being those conceived of as common to all states and populations. Just to make a few examples, we can list as a mode of enslavement Jure Civili, the case of the evasion of the census, and the uh, case of the evasion of the military service. Whereas the most common examples of enslavement Jure Gentium were the capture in war, and the captured person was then called Captivus, and the child born of a female slave even if this, in this case, the rule was then tempered by the application of the favor libertatis to some cases of child born of Ancilla, of women slave. A great English Roman law scholar, William Warwick Buckland, religious professor at, um, of civil law at the University of Cambridge from 1914 to 1945, wrote a well-known book on slavery in ancient Rome, entitled The Roman Law of Slavery. Uh, the book was published in 1908. And in this very uh, important work that could be considered a sort of milestone on the topic of slavery in ancient Rome, Buckland included the penal slavery in the group of modes of enslavement, Jure Civili. So typical of the Ius Civili, of the law of the Romans. Even if Buckland described the servitude of Spain as a sort of special case of slavery. Well, in fact, uh, even if it is necessary to pay attention to the eminent opinion of such a distinguished scholar, of course, uh, I would immediately like to stress that the so-called servitus pene cannot be easily classified as one of the many modes of enslavement known by the use civile, so by the law of the Romans. And I'll try to briefly explain why today. So the first question, Dealing with the, the, the um, servitus pene, the first question that arises is, what actually was the servitus pene? Was it a kind of slavery? Was it something different from any other kind of slavery known in Rome at the time of the Principatus? So at the time of, um, of the emperors. So from the first century AD onwards. Uh, of course, the term servitus and then uh, the terms serva or servus would suggest us that we are dealing with a kind of slavery, but it is a very peculiar kind of slavery. If we try, if we try to offer a first definition of the penal slavery, we can describe it as a consequence of a judgment that deprived the convicts of their freedom at, <clears throat> and at times their lives. Not every punishment, therefore, could bring about the subjugation of the convicts to the penal slavery, but only those kinds of capital punishments that caused a so-called capitis de minutio, maxima, that is to say a kind of status per mutatio. So a status per mutatio is the change of the status of the convict, of course. And in the case of the servus pene, it's the change of the status of the convict due to the loss of freedom. Yet this definition is not satisfactory at all. And it is not satisfactory at all for a simple reason. The servus pene may have been, before the condemnation, either a slave or a free man. It is clear, therefore, that only the freedman, the freeman, could lose his freedom, whereas it was impossible for a slave to lose something that he did not possess at all. As a consequence of the penal slavery, the freeman was destroyed by the enslavement, and if freed, was not the same person any longer. He or she did not recover his her rights. And if the convict had been a slave, the condemnation destroyed the ownership, and the ownership did not revive on pardon. The slavery punish of punishment led, therefore, to a social and legal death and to the subjugation of the convicted person to the punishment that he had to undergo. And as a consequence of that, the servus pene, if freed, became a so-called servus nullius. At least at the beginning, so at least uh, during the first cent two centuries of the empire. So a servus nullius was a, say, a slave without any owner. Of course, 
Um, for this reason, it is possible to affirm that the position of a servus pene was akin to death, and in any case, servitus pene entailed the legal death of the convicts. In the case in which the condemnation eventually caused the death of the convict, the latter, the latter suffer, suffered the legal regime of the slavery of punishment over the time between the definitive sentence, the final sentence, the final uh, judgment, and the execution. Another question. So which were the punishment that entailed the subjugation to the slavery punishment for the convicts? First, we can name the death by beheading. Beheading, so using a sword. The so-called gladium, the capitis amputatio. This punishment was the ancient pena capitis, the typical pena capitis uh, applied to some convicts at the time of the Republic, before and then later at the time of the Principatus. This was the main example of uh, death penalty, of course, in ancient Rome, but it was not the only manner to put to death a convict person. Yet there were many other atrocious punishments that led to the death of the convicts, and they were called by the Romans summa supplicia. They were the crucifixion, the gallows, the furca, the, the, the Romans called the gallows the furca, so the execution by hanging. The damnatio ad bestias, the damnatio ad bestias was the condemnation to fight with the wild beasts in the arena. At times, after having been already wounded or partly fastened and tied with chains. Um, then there was the uh, punishment of the so-called plumbatio, the plumbatio was created at the time of Constantine the Great, and it consisted in pouring liquefied lead in the throat of the convict. The vivi crematio, the vivi crematio consisted in burning alive the convict. And then the damnatio ad gladium, that could be intended as something different than the condemnation of the execution by a sword. We can have a look at one of the sources that I wrote down in the handout, and I suppose it's the number, uh, well, it's the number five. It is taken from the Collatio Legum Mosaicarum and Romanarum, so a work uh, um, that we can date at the end um, of the third, beginning of the fourth century after Christ, more or less, even if there are different theories and perspectives actually on the actual uh, datation of the Collatio Legum, but we can say that the Collatio Legum um, couldn't be uh, written down before the end of the third century AD. And I didn't wrote down in this case any kind of translation because I don't want to focus too long uh, on the Collatio. But the only thing that is very interesting is that at some point we read as autem differentia inter eos quiet gladium et eos quiet ludum damnantur. That is to say that the jurist here, the text was taken from a work by the jurist Ulpian, one of the most important jurists of the time of the Severan dynasty. Um, so there is a difference between the convicts that has been, have been condemned to the gladium, ad gladium, and the convicts condemned ad ludum. Nam ad gladium, damnati, confessed in consumum tur vel certe intranum debet consumi. That is, the jurist, explain, the jurist explains here that the damnati ad gladium were convicts who had to fight so who could um, either be executed immediately by sword, usually, or they could fight in the arena as gladiators. But in any case, if they did not die during the combats in the arena, they had to be executed within a year um, from when the, uh, since when the uh, final judgment was as, as had been issued. So the convict should be in any case executed. It could survive up to one year, but then it should be put to death. And this was a kind of condemnation different therefore from the 
let's say the mere, the simple um, capitis amputatio that I described before. All the punishments I have described until now inevitably implied the death of the convicts as the final event. Yet we have damnationes, condemnations, which did not necessarily lead to the death of the convicts, even if their living conditions were terrible and atrocious, of course. I allude to the damnatio ad ludum and the different kinds of condemnations to hard labor in the mines. So I begin with the former, I begin with the damnatio ad ludum, that was the condemnation to fight in the arena as a gladiator. Um, if we have a look once again at the text of the Colatio number five, the jury describes uh, some of the features of the Danazia Ludum. As I told you, the Danazia Ludum was the combination to fight as a gladiator in the arena. And the jury here explains that uh, the convict in this case should not be executed, yet to fight as a gladiator. And it could hope in some cases, to get the pileus or the so-called rudis, post intervallum, so after a certain period of time. And in particular, it could get back a sort of limited freedom after three years by getting the rudis, or it could get back the complete freedom after five years by receiving the pileus from the emperor. So there was a sort of, it was a kind of pardon, not exactly a pardon, a sort of indulgentia principis, but based on merits, on merits as a gladiator, um, that could be given to the convict after either three years or five years. I talked of a sort of limited freedom after three years in the sense that in this case, the convict received this sort of freedom, but it could be called back to fight again as a gladiator in the arena. So it was not completely, totally free, freed. And uh, uh, so this was another kind of condemnation. It was particularly important because of course, um, the gladiators combats were very popular uh, during the first centuries of the empire, at least until the third century after Christ in the Roman empire. Then there was, the so-called damnatio, or better, the different kinds of damnatio, there were the different kinds of damnationes to hard labor in the mines, the damnationes ad metalla, generally speaking. Uh, coming to hard labor, forced labor in the mines, um, we have to um, focus on the fact that there were different kinds, at least three different kinds of damnationes the so-called damnatio ad metalla, the opus metalli, and then the ministerium metallicorum in a decreasing order of severity. So the damnatio ad metalla was particularly harsh and severe. The opus metalli was in the middle. The ministerium metallicorum was less severe than the other two condemnations. Well, first of all, I would like to <clears throat> stress a point. The forced labor in the mines was of course, known in the Mediterranean area at that time. So we can uh, have a look at the examples coming from the Egypt, from Egypt, for example. Uh, there are many proofs of them in texts, in papyri in particular, uh, which prove that condemnation to hard labor, forced labor in the mines uh, was quite common in that area, but in many other areas of the, Mediter of, um, uh, of the Mediterranean, um, this kind of condemnation was quite common and was used quite often. And it was used very often by the Romans themselves. So as I told you before, the artist Damnatio was the first one, the Damnatio ad metata. In this case, the convicts all fastened together with heavy chains, uh, had to go down into the bowels of the earth to mine raw materials, and they did not see the sunlight for days. This is a description that we can find not only in sources uh, uh, written by the Roman jurists, but uh, also in some texts written by the fathers of the church, for example, also in, the, in some literature of the third and fourth century after Christ. 
According to the sources, and in particular with texts by Ulpian in particular, so Ulpianus, uh, um, the ninth book, the Officio Proconsulis, the Digest, 48-19-8, the convicts to the Opus Metalli instead were tied with less heavy chains than the Damnati at Metalla, and they mainly had to carry out a different kind of forced labor, such as the transportation and processing of the materials and similar tasks. Um, of course, these tasks were very hard, it is clear, but not as hard as the ones that the Damnati at Metalla had to fulfill. And then uh, the last kind of punishment that was the so-called ministerium metallicorum, a less severe condemnation if compared to the other two damnationes. Some scholars thought this was a punishment reserved to female slaves only, but if we read the sources of the Roman jurisprudence and compare the text by Ulpian, the above mentioned text by Ulpian, Digest 48, 8, to uh, a fragment, with a fragment taken from the first book, Iuris Epitomarum, by the jurist Hermogenianus. Hermogenianus was a jurist of the time of the Severan dynasty as well. Uh, we can actually affirm that the Ministerium Metallicorum could be inflicted to both female and men. So there was no gender distinction in this, in, in this case. Yet it is reasonable to think that the tests involved require less physical strength. That is the point. So for these reasons, women were usually condemned to Ministerium Metallicorum. And among the tests we can mention, for example, aid and support to the other convicts, uh, some um, tests regarding the transportations, uh, transportation of materials and this kind of things. And so, of course, the differences between the different kinds of damnations are not so clear, but we can <coughs> for sure affirm that the uh, hardest um, condemnation was the combination to uh, was the damnatio ad metalla. After a uh, rescript, so an imperial constitution issued by the Emperor Adrian, both the damnatio ad metalle and the damnatio ad opus metalli, so the first two damnationes, could not be inflicted ad tempus. That means these two punishments should be perpetual. So they should be in perpetuum, as Adrian wrote and said. We will see later on that this rule changed over the time. And uh, um, according to my studies, according to my research, I would say that uh, from the Severan dynasty onwards, uh, the damnationes ad metalla were um, any longer in perpetuum, except some, in some cases, in the, the most, uh, uh, so in the cases uh, involving the, the, um, uh, the worst crimes, of course, and the worst criminals. Otherwise, uh, there was the tendency to uh, condemn people to damnationes ad metalla only for a certain period of time, for a lot of reasons that uh, I will explain later if there will be the time to do it. In any case, the quite peculiar features that distinguish the position of the Servi Pene need to be better analyzed in the sense that it is quite clear, I would say, since now that the Servitus Pene was not the typical kind of slavery. And it is necessary to face the question concerning the origins of the Servitus Pene. In order to do that, I would like to start to investigate the issue by reading three sources that report the scriptum, an imperial constitution, issued by Antoninus Pius, often considered the point of departure for the legal creation of the legal regime concerning the Servi Pene by many scholars. The three texts are taken from the Digest, and they are the first three texts that I um, wrote down and uh, end out. So, um, First fragment is a fragment taken from the eighth book Ad Sabinus by the jurist Ulpian, Digest 29.2.25.3. The second one is a fragment by Marcianus, the 11th book Institutionum, Digest 34.8.3 Principium 1. 
And the third one is a fragment taken from the sixth book, The Cognizionibus, by Callistratus, Digest 49, 14, 12. So all these three jurists were jurists living uh, under the Severan dynasty. So it's um, um, so they were jurists uh, uh, of the late period of the late classical period of Roman law, and so they somehow had the possibility, the opportunity to see the development of the institute of the Servitus Penal to comment on the rescript issued decades before by Antoninus Pius. So all the three texts deal with the same question, with the same issue, with the same prescript issued by uh, Antoninus Pius, but only the second and the third one report, at least in part, but with some differences, the content of the rule created by Antonin, by the emperor. Um, I would say that for a simple question of time, I could read the text in English and not the text in Latin. And maybe I would prefer to do on the, the contrary in the, sense the, in the sense that I would prefer to read the text in Latin, but maybe it's easier if I read the text in English, I suppose. So I will go with the text in English. So the first one is the text by Ulbriam. And uh, uh, the translation says, if of course a person instituted here has become a Serbus Pene, because condemned to be executed or to fight with peace or to work in the mines, this will be treated as if the institution has not been made. And the deified Pius stated this by rescript. The second one by Marcianus, anything apart from provision of maintenance left to someone condemned to the mines is deemed not to have been written, but does not belong to the imperial treasury. This is a very important point. I will come back to this point later, but I underline it immediately. Since the criminal is the slave of the penalty, not of the emperor, and the deified Pius states this in a, in a rescript. If an appointed heir or legatee is condemned to the mines after the making of the will, that which was left to him does not belong to the imperial treasury either. And the last one by Callistus, in a particular, in a very, very important book, work, sorry, by Callistratus, the Cognizionibus. So Callistratus is here dealing with the problem of the process, the process in general, the, the, the so-called Cogniziones Extraordinum. So the last kind of uh, procedure developed in Rome. And in this case, in the sixth book is focusing on the um, criminal law procedure. The translation reads, freedom is taken away from those condemned to the mines, since they may even be punished by flogging like slaves. The deified Pius wrote in a rescript that the imperial treasury certainly did not acquire anything through a person of this kind. And accordingly, he wrote, any legacy to a person subsequently condemned to the mines did not belong to the imperial treasury. And as he says, they are servi pene rather than slaves of the treasury. Well, I will be uh, quite quick in my explanation because I will say that uh, these three texts um, play a huge role in my own book as well, but I don't have here the time to explain any, any, any problem emerging from this text, from these fragments. In any case, uh, one of the first elements that emerge uh, that emerges from the reading of the text is that all three texts are dealing with a problem connected to the law of secession. So there is a problem of the, um, of the, in the first text of a hair that has been instituted and then has become a servus pene. That is a problem connected to a bequest and a legatee in the second and in the third and in the, um, and in the third text. So the main problem is that there is a person um, that could receive something through a will as a heir or through a bequest as a legatee. This person had been condemned before or after the uh, bequest had been written in the will, 
and became valid. And in this case, of course, the convict could not receive the goods. The problem is, do these goods belong then to the imperial treasury, the fiscus? The answer by Antoninus Pius is not. And be, why? Because we have to consider that these convicts are not simple, simple, servi, fishy, so slaves of the treasure of, of the emperor, but they are to be considered rather servi, bene, so slaves of their own punishment. That is to say that the main problem dealt with by the emperor in this respect is a problem connected to the belonging of these goods and to the possibility to acquire these goods by the fisc, the imperial treasury. Antoninus Pius say, says, no, it's not possible. Why? Because these convicts had committed such crimes that they are different. They are separated from the servifici. They could not be considered servifici, so uh, slaves of the treasury of the imperial treasury. They have to be considered something else in this respect. And I would like to underline in this respect, why are they different from the servifici? Because the servifici, or oh, slaves of treasury or servicesari, slaves of, of the emperor. So there are many different ways um, to describe and to name uh, this category of slaves. But the servifici were quite similar to the servi publici. Servi publici were the slaves, we would say today, of the state. At the time of Rome, they were the slaves of the local communities, of the cities, in any of the populi, of the, 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 of the Roman people. So they were slaves belonging to Roman people and to uh, Roman Respublica before, to the Roman Empire later. They could... Uh, um, also retain very important high posts. For example, in the imperial administration, they could play very important role um, dealing with, with financial tasks, uh, dealing with the administration, either of the family or um, of the, 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 the Roman state. They could obtain many different kinds um, of posts and uh, fulfill different duties. So they were very important for the life of the Roman administration and the empire, and also for the, um, some, some of them, for the, the, the life of the imperial familia, so the family of the emperor. So they played an important role. And of course, uh, people who committed crimes and very uh, atrocious crimes in some cases, could not uh, have such posts, could not fulfill some uh, of those tasks that I have described before. For these reasons, it was necessary to separate, to distinguish the Servi Pene from the Servi Fishi, but, uh, or Servi Cesaris. But Antoninus Pius does not say anything else. He only distinguished the Servi in this respect, in, the, in this, uh, so with regard to the problem of the succession and the uh, belonging of the goods that in theory should go to the um, person that have been, had been then condemned. For a lot of reasons, therefore, I think that uh, this rescript by Antoninus Pius did not create if I can use this term, the servitus pene ex novo. It simply created a rule, a regulation, to try to uh, make order in the problem, in the great issue of the goods belonging to the fisc. If we have a look to the sources, uh, at least some sources um, that dated, uh, for example, to the... Um, the end of the first or beginning of the second century after Christ, we can immediately understand that the problem of the regulation of the legal condition of certain slaves was actually very present. I refer, first of all, to the letters of Pliny the Younger. I only 
wrote down two letters. I reported two letters uh, by Pliny the Younger. There are many other letters by Pliny, but of course I couldn't uh, report all these texts. I hear, I quoted here uh, Pliny the Younger, Epistole 1031, and Pliny the Younger, uh, Epistole, Epistole 1032. Uh, 10, the first one is the Epistola, the letter sent by Pliny to the Emperor Trajan. The second one is the answer, of course, of Trajan. And uh, um, Oh, sorry, I find the, I have to find the translation. Yeah, I read the translation of the of the two letters. The first letter by Pliny says, in many of the communities, but especially in Nicomedia and Nicaea, there are certain persons lying under sentence to the mines. So lying under sentence to the mines, that means the Nati ad metal, of course. To take part in the gladiatorial shows, so the Nati ad ludum, and to similar penalties. That means penalties that are um, uh, that deprive the convicts of their freedom, at least of their freedom, and to similar penalties who are now acting as and performing the duties of public slaves and are even throwing an annual salary as such. When I was told of this, I hesitated for a long time as to what course I ought, I ought to adopt. For I thought it would be showing too harsh a severity to end them over to their penalties after so many years, especially as many of them are old men and are, to all accounts, now living a decent, respectable life. Yet I thought I was, it was scarcely the proper thing to retain criminals as public servants. Moreover, to keep men doing nothing at state expense inexpedient, is inexpedient. Sorry. And if they were not kept, they might be a source of danger. I have therefore left the whole matter in suspense until I could take your advice. So Pliny addresses Trajan, who replies, edit out, um, sorry, let us not forget that you were sent to your province for the express reason that there seem to be many abuses rampant there, which required correction. So this is a first advice from the emperor to say we cannot be too mild because there is a problem connected to criminals in your province. So you have to pay attention to, to, to your role as a governor of the province. And most certainly we must redress such a scandal as that persons condemned to penalties should not only, as you say, be released there from without, oh, sorry, sorry, from without uh, authorization, but even be placed in stations which are to be filled by honest servants. So all those who were sentenced within the last 10 years and released on insufficient authority must be sent back to work out their sentences. And if, they are, <clears throat> and if there are any whose condemnation dates back beyond the last 10 years and are now old men, let us apportion them to fulfill duties which are not far removed from being penal. For it is the custom to send such cases to work in the public paths to clean out the sewers and to repair the roads and streets. So it is quite clear, it emerges quite clearly that Trajan tried to distinguish the person, the convicts who committed crimes from the other Sarvi Publici that could um, have become Sarvi for other reasons and not because they committed crimes, of course. It is a huge difference. And uh, we notice from the text by Pliny that Pliny is wondering, what have I to do? What I have to do with this kind of people? May I let them work in a Servi Publici, but Servi Publici is something different. Even, the, even if these people now are living a decent life, respectable life, as, as Pliny states, may I let them fulfill the duties that are typical of the Servi Publici and Trajan, let's say, the rule, the principle, according to which Trajan then takes his own decision is not, it is not possible. It's not possible unless they are old men and they have been condemned at least 10 years before this time. So they have already uh, been sentenced years before. And this is a, a very important passage, I suppose, because... Uh, it emerges a problem. It emerges the problem of the legal condition 
of people who can be considered ser servi, slaves, but not typical slaves, not servi publici, nor servi cesari or servi fisci. Be why? Because, because they are servi as a consequence of the punishment they have received for their crimes. And I try now to come to the problem of the origins of the servitus pene, because the time is running out and I don't want to, to finish too late. Um, I could go on for hours <laughs> dealing with the servitus pene, but I had to focus on, <laughs> on my conclusions now. So um, we have to think that since the time of the end of the Republic in Rome, there was a problem concerning the, for example, the effects of a will written by a man that was then sentenced to death. It was the case of Maleulus, for example, reported by Cicero and by author Adderenium. Maybe it was a sort of only an example, a rhetorical example, or maybe it was a concrete case. It is it's not important. I think what uh, is really important is the fact that both Cicero and, of course, other authors and juries began to think about the legal condition of a person sentenced to death at the end of the Republic. But at that time, the main punishment was the death penalty in the sense of the capitis amputatio that could be executed, so the, the, the convict would be executed almost immediately. The the time between the issuing of the judgment and the execution was usually very brief. And there were not so many problems, I would say, in the sense that the, the will was not valid, the, there were no other particular consequences. And in case the convict wanted to escape death, had to leave Rome and go to the ex in exile, to exile. The, Big problem, the, 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 the huge problem began to uh, grow when the um, new kind of punishment that developed um, over the, the centuries of the empire of the Principatus entailed a more or less long period of time between the judgment and the execution of the convicts. That is to say, there were some kinds of punishments who entailed, uh, for example, one year of time before the convict was executed, like in the case of the Danazi at Gladium, or a longer time, for example, like in other, uh, we can think, for example, at the Danazi at Pestius, um, after the judgment had been issued, um, the convict had expect to wait for the, uh, the, the, the next uh, uh, combats in the arena to be executed. And uh, combats, the combats, the, the shows, the gladiatorial shows um, could be organized in a, sh in, a, in, in, a, in a longer time, of course, and not immediately. And then there were some kinds of punishments who entailed instead a long period of slavery without the death as a final consequence of the punishment, like the Danazio Metalla, because the consequence of the judgment was this kind of slavery and the subjugation to, uh, to, to, to the punishment that consisted in forced labor, but the punishment itself did not entail the death of the convict, even if, of course, it was possible that the death occurred because it was so harsh that the, the, the living conditions, the living conditions of the captives were uh, so the convicts, sorry, were so harsh that they could die, of course. But in any case, death was not the final consequence. The legal death was the main point of the servitus pene. So I think that the servitus pene, better, the uh, legal regime regarding the servitus pene was created over the decades at the time of the empire, the Roman empire, the Principatus, in order to create a regulation to um, 
uh, to add rules regarding, for example, the wills, the legacy, and any other kind of juridical acts concerning the person that had been condemned. And in this sense, I think that the problem emerged since the time, at least since the time of Tiberius, the emperor Tiberius. Why um, have I mentioned Tiberius? Because at the time, uh, many different events took place. So first of all, under Tiberius, uh, there were a lot of condemnations for the crime of maestas. The crime of maestas, treasons, uh, so any act that could, could offend the state, the emperor, was one of the most atrocious crime, in, considered one of the most atrocious crime in ancient Rome, and usually the convict was put to death. But since the time of Tiberius, many of the people, for example, the case of Priscus, uh, many of the people condemned after uh, having um, committed a, um, a, crime, a crime of lesa maestas, were put to forced labor in the mines. At the same time, uh, when Tiberius reigned, there were a lot of confiscation of private mines that became part of the imperial treasury. Last but not least, it is at the time of Tiberius that a senatus consultum, so a senatorial decree was issued in order to allow the emperor to have 10 days to check, to control any kind of judgment issued by the Senate, so capital judgment issued by the Senate, before the capital judgment became uh, effective. So there were uh, actually 10 days between the issuing of the um, capital judgment and the moment in which that uh, judgment could be deposited at the erarium. Only at that time, the judgment became effective. And Tiber Tiberius wanted to have that time in order to check any kind of um, capital judgment issued by the Senate, to control the Senate. Uh, maybe also to use his lenitas in order to mild some of the punishments decided in, uh, given by the, the Senate to the uh, convicts. In any case, all these elements all together, according to my opinion, created a situation in which it was necessary to begin to find legal solutions for the condition of these convicts between the sentence, the judgment, and the execution of the judgment, or in case there was no execution, mm, sorry, and, and the execution of the convicts themselves. And if there was no execution, it, it was necessary to find rules in order to decide what to do with these people. And once more, and there are some elements we can infer from other texts, for example, from an epigraphic uh, text like the Aes Italicense, um, I wrote, I quote a few lines from the Aes Italicense, but there is no time now to, to, to uh, deal with it in depth. In any case, from some other sources, we understand that there were procuratores or other Roman magistrates who have had to deal with the convicts. For example, to sell the convicts, to sell people to fight in gladiatorial combats and shows as damnati at gladium. There was a procurator named in the Aes Italicense. For example, the Aes Italicense is a document um, probably then issued by the Senate, but we only have the prima sentence, so the discussion uh, made by the Senate, the first senator who talked uh, in the Senate, and the Aes Italicense dated back at uh, 177, 178, after Christ, so at the time of Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Commodus. And uh, so all these elements, let me think that uh, Antoninus Pius did not create the Servitus Pen. He only introduced some other rules to try to regulate the situation that was particularly difficult to deal with, because this kind of survey was not, were not the common kind of survey 
existing in Rome since the time of the, Rep uh, of the Republic. And uh, these problems, these issues uh, began to arise at least since the beginning of the Principato. So I don't want to say that Tiberius created the Servi Pene or the, 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 the Servitus Pene as an institution, of course, but I want at least to stress the fact that these problems were actual at the time of Tiberius, at the time of Trajan, as we can read from Pliny, Pliny's letter, at the time of Adrian, who uh, issued a lot of rescripts on this problem. And therefore, over the decades, the imperial chancery, together with the Roman juries, created a lot of rules to try to, um, to, to um, develop a legal regime that was a legal regime devoted to this particular kind of slaves. Yet, I suppose that the example, so the basis for this legal regime was the legal regime of the Servifici, but the Servipene, so the rules applied to the Servipene were created as exceptions to the rules applied to the servifici. But there is a connection with the servifici that we can infer from many sources, from the Aes Italicense that I quoted before, from, for example, I quote it quickly, I quote uh, the, the, the text quickly, um, from the 11th text that I wrote down, that is a text taken from the Codex of Justinian, uh, issued between 200 53 and 268 AD. It's um, an imperial constitution by Valerianus et Gallienus, in which uh, we can read, and if he is in possession of any of your property, the procurator will act as a judge for you, for he begins to be a slave of the treasury. It is quite clear. So the emperors have in mind the servifici, but not, not in any case, only when the slaves, the slave, the servus pene, so after, sorry, the servus pene has been released, uh, has been released. So only after he has been released, usually on pardon, it could become again servus pene with the legal regime that could be applied to the servus pene. So the servus pene, and I, uh, I'm going to finish, the servus pene, according to me, um, represented a way to regulate all that cases of capital punishment that led to the loss of freedom of, or of life for the people, for the convicts. But capital punishment meant something different, of course, at the time of the Principatus, then at the time of the Republic. Capital punishment at the time of the Republic meant, yes, of course, a status per mutatio, but mainly the death of the convict. Capital punishment means something else at the time of the Principatus, means a sort of separation of the convict from the rest of the society. And it's a physical, somehow physical, and in any case, legal separation from the rest of the society. The, on, the last thing I would like to say, and sorry if I was a, if I made a bit of confusion in my explanation, but there are so many things <laughs> to explain. Um, the last thing I would like to stress is the fact that uh, um, the case of the Serapene represented a sort of laboratory of ideas and rules for the Roman jurisprudence and the, and the imperial chancery, in the sense that many rules, many criminal law rules that we now consider quite common and usual. For example, the graduation of the penalties, of the punishments, according to the circumstances, according to the, to the social, um, to the um, uh, features of the criminal, um, represented problems on which the jurists, Roman jurists, um, spent a lot of their, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, sorry, on which a Roman jurist wrote a lot of texts and uh, had to think about at that time because uh, um, we can easily appreciate the fact that there were different penalties to different uh, 
um, that that has to be different according to the differences, distinguishing one criminal from another criminal, uh, a criminal that acted and committed criminal uh, is is crimes uh, in a part of the empire or in a province or in another province. So there were so many rules, and they tried to create so many different rules to offer. Uh, not a systematic, but at least a, a group of uh, principles that is quite surprising, I would say, because uh, we usually talk of Roman legal tradition as uh, the legal, the private law tradition, of course, that it's, it's like that. But I would say, I would only like to say that sometimes when we read, of course, the text of the Roman jurists, uh, and Roman jurists did not distinguish so domestically as we do nowadays, uh, uh, public and private, of course, and when they deal dealt with the problems emerging from uh, criminal issues, they were in any case able to uh, elaborate such principles and rules that I think um, they, uh, that I, they, that re still represent uh, a sort of um, patrimony that we can uh, look at, and um, at it. That is, I would say, one of the foundations of the uh, Roman legal tradition as well. It represents one of the foundations of the Roman legal tradition as well. Um, well, I was, um, I would say, I have talked for a long time, so I, it is now time to, to stop for me. So thank you very much for your patience uh, and um, thanks.